put both of the organisations up, thank you, put both of the organisations up there, because I wear two hats. So I'm a freelance or consultant archaeologist under MB Archaeology, but I'm also a director for Involve Heritage CIC, so a not-for-profit um, company that is, um, well, there just to help people get involved in their local heritage, as the name suggests. So um, I'll keep flipping between the two different things uh, as we go through. So, um, <clears throat> 20 years of time team then helped to turn an army of armchair archaeologists into the thriving network of community archaeologists. This is often a phrase I use in introductory sessions with new adult ed groups or community projects. Of course, there are many other factors that have helped to create a huge nat national interest in being actively involved with the country's heritage, but the metaphor of swapping your TV remote for a trowel is a good one and one that many can relate to. Um, apologies, Carenza. There you are. <laughs> um, maintaining, the time, <laughs> maintaining the time team link then, uh, when the late Mick Aston set out on his archaeological career in the 60s and 70s, amateur archaeology, that is involving students and members of the public as volunteers, was fairly common. There was a lot more opportunity for research archaeology than, say, in the later, late 1980s and 1990s when the introduction of PPG 16 and subsequent protection of our heritage through a requirement for structured rescue archaeology uh, in many ways changed how those outside of the profession, i.e. those not employed as professional archaeologists, were involved. Without causing too much controversy here, uh, many feel that was a good thing. Even today there are those who do not see community archaeology as real archaeology. The results somehow not as meaningful. I would argue, though, that if properly supervised and supported and with adequate training and education, actually community archaeology can often provide better results, as digs are usually not under the same pressures as those of a commercial nature. However, the problem with the term community archaeology is twofold. What does community mean and what does archaeology mean? If you can forgive the pun, let's dig a little deeper. Is the term community in community archaeology a reference to local people or to a specific part of society or is it something else? For example, can the community of a given project exist in a different part of the world and never be physically involved, as could be the case in crowdfunded projects, for example? And to the community, uh, is archaeology simply another word for digging a hole? In answering these questions, I wish to briefly consider what I would argue are the three main models of community archaeology in use today, and then show why none of them are sustainable. As mentioned, no controversy here then. So model one is the HLF model. The HLF model is probably the most common model used for funding community archaeology projects in the UK. To give an idea, uh, on average, and this is an average, around £150,000 is awarded to community projects each month in the East Midlands region through the Our Heritage and Sharing Heritage streams. Now, this means we have a consistent funding stream with enough available revenue to fund meaningful community projects over a duration of most commonly one to three years. The issues with this model uh, are that due to the sheer number of people becoming involved in community archaeology, this revenue stream is very competitive and there simply isn't enough funding to cover all the applicants, regardless of how good your bid is. Put bluntly, the more people we encourage to get involved in their heritage, the less funding there is to support them all. A further issue is that the price of a lottery ticket has increased from £1 to £2. This, uh, you might think, would bring in additional revenues. But unfortunately, this hasn't been the case, as in these times of austerity, people are actually buying less tickets. One further point to consider is that the requirements for the funding are moving away from archaeology as time progresses. Most HLF bids are expected to have a digital element within them, uh, including things like creating and updating web platforms and social media accounts. This can be quite problematic for community groups, many of whose members are not digitally savvy. One of our projects was encouraged to create a project film, but none of the group had the skills to do it. So we worked with two local Duke of Edinburgh Award teenagers who filmed and edited one uh, as part of their assessment process. On the last two HLF bids we submitted, we were asked the same question. How are you going to involve people from outside of those interested in archaeology? 
which for an archaeology project seems a bewildering question, but is one that needs to be addressed successfully in order to obtain the funding. The result is often that HLF-funded archaeology projects have additional elements, such as, as mentioned, creation of a project film or an arts-based element. While these certainly add different and often rewarding mediums to the project, there is a danger that the archaeology suffers due to the shift in focus and the use of an often tight project budget to fund these additional elements. Ultimately, for good or bad, the project that is awarded funding is often markedly different to the one you set out to do and often requires reducing or dropping specific elements of the original project plan. That said, we have led several successful HLF-funded archaeology projects. Uh, as time constraints only allow me to discuss one of them, I've opted <coughs> for the Spa Ponds Heritage Project for the Mansfield region of Nottinghamshire, as it has greatly impacted on the lives of the local community in a high deprivation area. The project saw us work with the Forest Town Nature Conservation Group to identify, record and make management recommendations for a series of heritage features within their Spa Ponds site. The ponds form part of the Royal Estates of Sherwood Forest and through documentary and map work we know they were constructed as fish ponds in 1317 to serve a defensive peel built for King Edward on a, high, on a hill immediately adjacent to our site. We also proved that the Royal Deer Park was extended and thus incorporated the lower half of the Spa Ponds Nature Reserve. By providing archaeology training and support to skills passport standards, we supported the group members in surveying and researching several features, including earthwork boundaries, the ponds themselves, old trackways and boundary markers and other features, and co-wrote a heritage management plan for the site with them so that they could preserve and protect the important heritage assets. Subsequently, we were appointed as archaeological consultants for the site and helped the group get the site added to the local non-designated heritage asset list. One of the elements I personally think that not enough community archaeology projects consider is sustainability and what happens after the HLF money runs out. By providing training to an existing group, albeit not an archaeology group in this case, but one who did need the skills to effectively manage their site, uh, and creating a heritage management plan, the project gave the group skills and knowledge to continue to care for the site beyond the life of the HLF funding. And uh, we also held sessions in the pub. Nothing wrong with that. Um, model two then, <coughs> slightly different now then, adult education model. So the second main strand for community-based archaeology is via the adult ed model. Class-based educational sessions for mature students, i.e. anyone over the age of 21. Um, yes, anyway. This can be from continuing ed at university level uh, and other recognised qualifications, right down to learning for fun uh, via organisations like the WEA, the U3A or local council education providers. Over the last few years, we've seen a shift away from continuing ed, as funding cuts means many university departments are no more. So locally to me, the University of Nottingham had a thriving <coughs> continuing education department with an undergrad, certificate, diploma and full BA in archaeology and a master's in local history. The two-year certificate in archaeology, part-time, regularly had 20 to 25 learners enrolled each year. This is now all gone. WA and council courses have seen numbers drop as fees rise and learner paperwork increase dramatically in order to fulfil requirement from a uh, skills funding agency. Enrolment forms now require national insurance numbers, date of birth, contact numbers and other personal information and many learners are sceptical about providing this level of personal data due to recent high profile data breaches. Personally then, um, I've taught adult ed courses and workshops for 10 years but find it easier and more profitable to run classes privately now. Uh, this removes the need for learner paperwork, means personal data is not required, and actually means course fees are considerably lower for them. This, of course, makes you self-employed, and thus employment benefits such as pension schemes, holiday and sick pay go out the window. Um, <clears throat> adult Edge should not always be class-based, lecture-style sessions, in my opinion, uh, as this does not allow for the best learning experience. Archaeology is a multifaceted discipline, and so the way we teach it and train people in it should reflect that. Having stressed that point, it is equally important to realise that some learners actually work better and learn more in a more formal education setting. Uh, and not everyone is confident enough to learn in a hands-on uh, 
group activity learning experience. So creating a model that incorporates all those different elements, so lectures and field visits and group work and practical activities, like you can see on the screen, um, ensures that all learners are engaged. Not all adult ed providers agree with that stance, believe it or not. Um, with one adult ed provider who I started my teaching with a long time ago, my determined stance that I intended to include field visits was met with nervous apprehension. Uh, field visits would be out of the norm and probably wouldn't work, I was informed, but I did them anyway. Um, <clears throat> one of the things around that is to get people to think about archaeology differently, and I'd have to point out this slide on the bottom right. Yes, I did get them to look through a load of household rubbish. Uh, the aim was to give them a bag of rubbish from different households with completely different um, you know, families or whoever, occupants, and let's try and work out who lived in the house, what they liked to do, whether they had any um, you know, dietary requirements, and try and make connections between some of those uh, things in there. So someone found a lot of cans of beer and paracetamol, and they definitely went together. Um, but it's what we do on site, isn't it? We look for those artefacts and we try to recreate you know, who lived there. So that's the adult ed model. <laughs> um, the next one, the final of the three, is the crowdfunding model. So <clears throat> this is one of the most recent models to be applied to community archaeology uh, and is certainly the most difficult to make work. For those who don't know much about the model, <clears throat> it requires the public to buy into a project and in return get something back. Generally, the more they buy in, the more they get back. So, for example, uh, £10 may get you email updates and electronic copies of reports. £500 may get you a week's digging. Uh, the Dig Ventures team are using this model to great success and continue to grow year on year. And many see the crowdfunding model as the future of community archaeology funding as HLF and other sources become ever more competitive. But, for me, here lies the issue. If we start charging the community to take part in archaeology, are we in danger of making it exclusive rather than inclusive? Um, and what repercussions does charging sometimes considerable amounts of money have on the CBA's motto of archaeology for all? In late 2014 then, uh, we decided to trial this crowdfunding model to fund our newly established Roman Southwell community project. <coughs> Incidentally, Dig Ventures supported us in our initial campaign and helped us to understand how the process worked. We very quickly realised, though, that if this was to be a sustainable project funded solely by the public, then some rather considerable tweaks of the crowdfunding model would be needed. After all, as a director of uh, Involve Heritage, how could we justifiably exclude those who wanted to take part but couldn't afford it? Well, our model is one that does not require people to pay to join in. The project is open to anyone in the local area, but those people are expected to help fundraise to keep the project going, help with admin and publicity and so on. Beyond that, we encourage public support and donations. This may be by paying £5 to hear a talk, buying our Roman gladiator beer uh, at £2.50 a bottle, uh, dropping your loose change into our donations bucket, or as many do, pledging the odd 10 or £20 via our online GoFundMe campaign. But as you can imagine, it takes an exhausting amount of energy to continually raise the money required to keep the project going. <clears throat> also as part of this then, we subsidise 10 community training placements every summer during our dig season. We charge £150 per week and ensure that the focus is on those placements. <coughs> so our group members do the bucket emptying and the tea brewing, not the placements. The placements spend time learning how to dig, how to draw, how to take dumpy levels or do section drawings, and again working towards their archaeology skills passports. We also seek small grants to help fund specific elements of the project or local business sponsorship. In return to business sponsorship, we do a press piece and display their logos on public talks and on reports. This helps to fund our work, but more importantly it shows how the community supports that work. There is nothing wrong with running full cost field schools or charging people to take part, provided the cost directly relates to the experience, in my opinion. We choose to charge as little as we possibly can while still ensuring the project remains sustainable. <clears throat> 2019 will be the project's sixth year, so we feel it's working. Um, <clears throat> so why do I not think all those are not sustainable then? Well, it's very hard 
to be a full-time professional community archaeologist by using one of those methods. And what I've found over the last 10 years is to create a model that incorporates all of them. So it might not be something that you know, most people would do, but that you can't, you know, you can't make a full-time living from a HLF-funded project, or you can't bring enough money in through crowdfunding. Why not do all of them? <coughs> so the MB archaeology model, as I've called it then, <coughs> for me, it's the hardest model of all of those. Uh, but it's the most rewarding, and it has allowed me to work almost exclusively within community archaeology for 10 years. Uh, I still do the odd bit of consultancy work or research, but only if it benefits the local community or one of our projects. 99% of what I do each year is community archaeology, uh, and of that, perhaps 10 to 15% is digging, uh, which takes us right back to the start and to the question, what is archaeology? A crucial point to understand is that digging is expensive and it is hard work and generally your target audience couldn't cope with digging all year round. Uh, only focusing on digging also excludes a lot of people. Some can't physically do, uh, dig due to age or health, um, but as people have shown already today that's not always a barrier and shouldn't be, uh, but, but a lot of people don't actually want to dig. What they do want to do though is see the finds or hear a talk about your work, visit sites, learning class-based environments. So under this model, every day for me is different. <clears throat> I may be leading some community geophysics surveys on Monday, documentary research on Tuesday, field working on Wednesday, I know this sounds like Craig David, by the way, um, or teaching a class, delivering a school session, writing an article to promote a project, trying to fundraise or organise an event. Uh, every day is different. At present then, we have projects funded by the HLF, the Nunavut Trust, the crowdfunding model, inspire learning and private classes and residential trips. Um, it's my job to bring all that funding and opportunities in, as well as being able to manage it and deliver it all. Uh, currently then, we're working on two separate medieval village sites, a Roman landscape, a Saxon and medieval religious site, the Civil War landscape <coughs> excuse me, around Newark, uh, with uh, potentially next year, Operation Nightingale team. Uh, and... Um, also, uh, residentials planned as far apart as the Derbyshire Peak District, Orkney and Cumbria for 2019. So, to wrap up, archaeology is about all these things then. It's not just digging a hole. Uh, studying the landscape via LIDAR, geophysics and field walking. <coughs> looking at old maps or survey data. Visiting a castle. Poring over old documents. All of those things. Um, admittedly, not many archaeologists may have the skill set to be able to teach, train people in digging, undertake geophysics, lecture on the Bronze Age one day and the Civil War the next, and be able to deal with people of all walks of life every single day, as well as project manage, fundraise, write reports, funding bids, recognise medieval pottery, and still find time to eat cake. <laughs> Very important. Um, but I might argue uh, that's down to... Uh, the limited scope of training and development post-university degree. And I don't mean this in a negative way, um, but doing an undergrad degree and then going off to be a, a serial digger, of course, it won't teach you those skills. Um, but for me, it's not the same job. Uh, to return to the title of this paper, it's important to recognise the community part of community archaeology. Uh, I would argue that to be successful and sustainable as a community archaeologist, it is important to spend time learning the skills that best reflect the needs of the community you aim to work with. For example, working with schools or young archaeology clubs requires a different skill set to working with university students and to the more traditional community group makeup, i.e. the retired. Uh, year upon year, the community grows wider and more diverse, again as we're seeing throughout today, and that is a credit to our profession and the ways we are working with the public. But, as the recent Mendoza report on audience diversification within the museum sector has shown, those engaged and involved still tend to be from white and higher socio-economic backgrounds. We continually need to find new ways <coughs> to engage and involve people from all areas of society with their local heritage, and community archaeology can have a huge role to play in the years ahead. Even work with cows, now and again who just destroyed our test bit. Um, and that, that, I just want to end really on that bit. It's about fun as well. <coughs> Lots of cake, tea, beer, 
whatever it is, uh, is your poison. <laughs> um, but it's about people having fun. People often forget that element of community archaeology. It's not just about the archaeology. It's called community archaeology and creating those networks and those groups and those friendships um, is integral to, to, um, to what we do. I'm just going to finish with, well, what is community? And I heard a little quote on the, uh, on the TV the other day that I quite liked. And they, they said, community is better found when we ignore the lines on a map and instead look to the people with a shared bond. And what is, that goes back to one of the questions I asked, what is community? Uh, thank you all very much.